So um, I'm just going to begin with my own welcome to country. We respectfully acknowledge the wisdom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to their custodianship of the lands and the waterways. The lands on which Spinifex offices are situated are the Juru, Bunurong and Wurundjeri, Wadawurrung, Aora and Noongar. So we, we also acknowledge the many women throughout history who have fought for women's freedom, often at the cost of their lives. Before the speakers begin, the, I have to share a screen. And here we go. Share. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Fabulous. <laughs> I'd like to mention Doris Katinri, whose autobiography, Kick the Tin, which you can see on the screen, is about her life as a member of the Stolen Generation. And we published that back in 2000. Very sadly, Doris passed away last year, but her memories live with us and in her book. The authors of Taru, Growing Up Gurindji, uh, Violet Wadrill, Biddy Wavehill, Yamawar, uh, Topsy Dodd, Nganjal, and Felicity Meekins are also not able to join us this evening. So we send them our good wishes. Um, so, Welcome to everybody who's here, both panellists and audience. This is our first Zoom event as part of a series of events for the 30th year, year anniversary of Spinifex. There are a lot of speakers. It's very exciting, somewhat nerve-wracking. Um, <laughs> and I hope you'll bear with us if, if I mess anything up. Um, so remember to stay mute while the panellists are speaking and after, at the end, we'll have a question and answer as much as we can. And you can ask questions in the chat section on the side. Um, okay, so our first speaker is Judy Atkinson. I just need to move the slide. Okay, here we go. Uh, is Judy Atkinson, AM. Judy's book, Trauma Trails, Recreating Songlines, The Transgenerational Effects of Trauma in Indigenous Australia is our most reprinted title. We have actually lost count, but we know that it's more than 10 times. It was shortlisted for the Australian Awards for Excellence in Educational Publishing in 2003, and it is on courses uh, around the world. Judy is of Jiman and Bundjalung descent as well as having German Celtic heritage, she is Professor Emerita at the Indigenous Studies College of Southern Cross University. Welcome, Auntie Judy Atkinson. I can't remember when I have felt so excited about something, so thank you for having me here. I'm actually sitting, looking out over a whole host of trees, uh, and it's been raining for about five days. I'm in Wittable Wyabal land, part of the Greater Bundjalung Nation. So I want to give respect to uh, those elders here who are past and present, but more particularly the elders, both male and female, who came to me at different times and said quietly, Judy, we've got to focus on the children. So um, that's where I guess I am now in my life is thinking about what we can do for the children and we've been asked to do some work in Tennant Creek. Uh, mm. I've been doing a lot of work in Western New South Wales and we just had a visit from Kate York asking if we'd do some work there, particularly <coughs> focusing on children. Um, you've all got a chance to read Trauma Trails if you want to, but I just, I like to tell stories. And at this moment, in Australian history, we're seeing something I think that is fundamental and outrageous, and that is what's happened in Parliament House, and it typifies how people just would not listen. So um, I was in Cape York working with the Aboriginal Coordinating Council in 1987, and at 11 o'clock that morning on the 18th of September, we had to make a decision about $23 million of housing money. Now, the feds had come in with the money, and it was a we, we had no idea how many people lived in communities, how many houses were in communities. The state government was not going to give us that. And after we had finished making this decision, within 10 minutes, 
and it was kind of crazy, not very informed. Um, an elder called Auntie Judy Bromby, and I have permission to use her name, she since passed, came up to me and said, girly, can I talk to you? And I said, sure, Aunt. So I then went out to sit with her later that day, and she said, a little five-year-old was raped here last week. Can you help us? And it shocked me because it was the first time I'd heard anything like that in any of the Cape communities, and I was travelling and working throughout them. And it was true. I went to all of the council, the 27 men and one woman in the Aboriginal Coordinating Council, and I said, you look at this. Now, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody was in place at that time. It had just started. And I found as I started to research it that more women had been uh, killed than all the deaths in custody. But nobody was talking about that. I'm talking in particular about North Queensland and the Cape. Then I went to the police, I went to child protection, I went to the health services in that particular community. And they just shrugged their shoulders and said, oh, it's cultural, what can we do? And that changed my life. Uh, I walked away from there knowing I had to do something. So I uh, came back down to where my dad grew up in uh, the Capricorn coast of Queensland, uh, having moved away from Yemen country with his grandmother. And... Um, I started to ask if people were interested and that was the, that was the location of the PhD. Now, what I want to do now is to show you that, in fact, the situation has got decidedly worse. Um, I'm working across Australia in Kimberley, uh, in the Territory, in Cape York, in Western New South Wales, and it's much, much worse than what I first encountered at that time. But the good news is this is that uh, there's a group of us have been working very solidly on the theory base to what we're doing. So uh, we've got a book uh, that's uh, been put together by, uh, we've been invited to PACPA, into PACPA, the Psychotherapy and Counseling Federation of Australia. We've now established within there the College of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Healing Practices. And the book uh, will detail the work that we've been doing on a theory based around Indigenous healing practices as a standalone therapy in its own right, as relevant as CBT and all of the other kinds, but from a deep cultural base. So I'm excited about that. Um, Charles Darwin University started to talk to us about it and now we've located it in, and we're talking to them at the moment, uh, Bachelor Institute. So out of one book, this is the book, uh, and out of the page here, the prologue, my great grandmother's gift, I believe that the, the grandmothers are giving us gifts now. It's the time for women to come forward. And they're speaking out in ways I haven't seen or heard before, um, which I think is really exciting. I'd like to move that big voice out of Canberra, however, and I'd like to bring it back to our communities. Um, so I want to finish by saying this book, this book changed my life. Um, I get communication from some of the big wigs in the United States and people from the UK asking me more about uh, what we're still doing around these issues. So I'm going to now stop and hand over to somebody else. But thank you for having me. And I'm really, really, I can't tell you how excited I am to be here. And, and Diane, I'm just looking at you sitting there at the moment. And I want you to know that your work was inspirational for me when I was trying to find my way through what I was uh, thinking and trying to understand at that time. Zol, there is many women who have helped me along the track. So thank you very much, Susan, for inviting me. Well, thank you so much, Judy. Uh, it's been fabulous to have you here and to uh, have you speak at this very first 30th anniversary event. Um, and our next speaker is, in fact, Zolde. Oops, go back. Zolde Ishtar. Um, so you can see her beautiful holding Yawalu book here. I'll just introduce her. Zol Deshta is the author of Holding Yawalu, White Culture and Black Women's Law, for which she won the Izzy Liebler Prize for her PhD on which the book is based. Zol lived in, and worked in Wurramanu on the edge of the Great Sandy Desert for 20 years and helped establish the Kapalunangu Women's Law and Culture Centre. And Zol um, also wrote um, her, her book, Daughters of the Pacific. I'll show you what that looks like. 
um, Daughters of the Pacific, which was published in 1994. And she was also editor of Pacific Women Speak Out for Independence and Denuclearization. And for her work on uh, as a peace activist in 2005, she was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize as part of the 1000 Women for Peace campaign. Mm -hmm. um, so Zol, over to you and I will drop um, turn it off because it's a bit hard to um, do everything otherwise including <laughs> admit people I can't admit people if I'm sharing or I might be able to but I've only just discovered that <laughs> okay Zol where are you I'm here can you right. see me can I you can hear me now that you're speaking I can I, I, I've just got to say how amazing uh, privilege and honor it is to be here um, for Spinifex's 30th birthday and I just feel overwhelmed by all of the wonderful magnificent stunning uh, world-changing women who are here and um yeah wow uh, I don't know I feel a bit um, um overwhelmed but uh yeah so I want to talk to you about Holding yarn, will you? The importance of holding a law. So many islands. I want to acknowledge the Bandan, the senior women elders that grew me up. I want to acknowledge my own ancestors. And <clears throat> I want to thank all the bosses that are here uh, with us today from all your different countries. And there will be truth telling. And there is truth telling and it's going to get bigger and we will acknowledge the sovereignty of the first peoples um, is, has never been ceded, could never be ceded. So, and I want to thank also Susan and Renata for stepping behind these incredible women and the women of the desert and the women of the Pacific. This woman here, Abakai, who I knew at the age of six and fell in love with, is now 32. So, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to write, read a bit out of these books. Sorry, I'm not sorry, I'm crying because of the moment of just being with you lot. So let's start. Susan with the video, can we, so that the okay. bosses from Balgo can speak their own truth? Okay, so I just to tell you that I, my screen disappeared for a moment, but luckily it came back on. So here's hoping this works. Okay. We were hoping that they would be here today, but that has not happened. Okay, so I'm starting the video now. Can, can you see it? Put your yes, small okay, good. Turn a little screen. I should say that the woman on your left is the one. The next woman is her sister, Omali. And the next woman with the yellow hat is um, Nakramari. We come here, a special place, to, to bring our young people so they can learn from us. We, to teach them about singing and dancing, very important for them. We're the second generation, and the young ones want to teach them. They can be strong. The next time, they, if they they can come, if we go bush trip, they can come more often. They can learn more. You know, but uh, we we it's all the uh, old people. They died now, and we're the second generation. We're gonna send over this to look up any place, make sure everything is good. And one the young ones, taking them dancing and painting them and singing song, they can learn song too. Young ones, very special place that women come out and do dancing for this land. They sing song, make everything. Make everything alive, you know. Then the country comes back when people come out 
and do this singing and dancing, everything come out. Otherwise, if we don't teach our young ones, they'll never learn. <laughs> That's why we want them to come, follow, follow us, wherever we go, trips, to bring them, to teach them, to sing songs. Because our young ones, the oldest ones, they died now. We, we try and this last one, my auntie, Ma Mari. She's, my auntie, she's, she, they sing, all the elders sing songs. And she's one of the strong ladies now, and me, that Rita. We can always bring other people with us from other places they, if they want to come and join us. They can bring their kids too. They want, if they want their kids to learn about the Aboriginal way. And that will keep Algo strong and of young people to be strong, to listen and learn from us. So these are the women that I have been blessed to grow up beside. We were grown up by the same old ladies. And um, most of them are finished now, which is really sad. But the oldest um, woman now we have is the last, one of the last women to have first contact out in... Um, uh, Willingkara country, which is um, Lake Mackay area. Uh, and yeah, she's still living on at the Jilami on the women's law ground, which is great, which is an achievement. So what I write about in Holding Yawalyu is my first experience of the first two years of living with them and what I learned as a white woman. Then the stories began in earnest. The women told stories about dogs, dogs that chased emus, dogs that flew, Jorkopa dogs, listing place after place. The storytellers followed the dreaming tracks of the ancestor Gunyarpa dogs. It was because of these adventures that the people really love their dogs, I was told. The focus shifted and the stories began to recall lived experiences that the elders had had during their participation in the women's law meetings, ritual gatherings in the past. The stories wove in and out of tales of deep spiritual ceremonies to episodes of clowning and trick playing. Occasionally an elder, recalling the Jorkapa, broke into song. Often we would all laugh at the antics that they or other women got up to in the past for fun. The elders told me the power of the power of the women ancestors of the Jerkopa, the fear that men hold of women's Yawulu law, and the punishments meted out to men who violated women's sacred spaces. The women's stories were full of secrets, which they insisted I was not to retell. And I respect that. As a full moon rose above the horizon, two of the older women elders, two Napanank, Napanankas, two direct sisters, announced that they would have a ceremony to mend a dreaming by dancing with sacred objects that had been recently brought to the keeping place. The elders painted each other in ochres until they glistened in the firelight. The little granddaughter was sent to bed because the turko, the ceremony, would be too powerful for her. Time passed as we waited for her to fall asleep. Then the Napanaka sisters began the singing. When everyone was singing, the older sister stood up and moved out onto the dancing ground. The other women wailed, then continued singing. The elder danced, swaying her arms and moving her feet in the ways taught by the ancestors. A stanza ends 
ended. The singing stopped. She stopped. Women whispered amongst themselves. Moments lapsed, and then the singing was picked up again, this time with more crescendo. In between each stanza, the women discussed the Jokopa stories that they were performing and the finer points of the dance. They also discussed mundane things, such as what to do with the dogs that had gone inside and were ransacking the kitchen. Or they were thirsty and needed water and directed me to go and get it. The singers told me with deep pride, reflected in their faces, that this dancer was number one, boss woman. This is the same woman who's still living on the Jilami right now. She danced many stories that night, sometimes together with her sister and with other women and sometimes alone. She seemed to be on a quest of commanding the forces that she perceived existed in the universe. She was calling them up. The song echoed powerfully from her small frame, as answered by the songs of the women who sat watching, witnessing. The atmosphere was electric, tactile. The story was played out as women retraced the steps of the ancestor women. After two hours of dance and song, and having determined that the power had been restored to their dutical secret, sacred items, the two sisters moved onto the dance ground one last time. This time they worked to finish up the portal with the ancestral realms. Calling out in every direction, they brought the energy back into their bodies. The leading dancers spread her arms in a wide embrace and then brought them down to her side closing the ceremony but judy that judy you have uh, met and hosted one of that woman um mania sarah daniels Napananka. so what i learned out in the desert is the importance of the integrity of cultural ritual cultural revival and I just want to read a, a bit here that is written to European women. I think I do. No, I don't. Sorry. <laughs> it's um, the importance of white women to grow up. Here we have Daughters of the Pacific, my first book. Uh, I've been out to the Pacific. This is um, based on a tour a journey um, at Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp. I set up um, uh, the Women's Network for a Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific. We supported um, Indigenous women uh, from 1983 through to 1999. 10 years after I had left England and come home to Australia. So, yeah, I've actually been back to the desert three times since to different countries, mainly Balao, uh, Marshall Islands, uh, matrilineal nations where women uh, remain strong. But is Palfrey with us? No, she hasn't turned up yet, which I'm very sad about. Um, Can you see this beautiful old drawing? Yes. Yes. Oh, free. Um, gave her drawing to this beautiful book, Our Women's Voices. And um, so I just want to acknowledge her. She's a Maori woman from Aotearoa. And um, without her, this book would not be the masterpiece that she created it to be. So, I, so it's also on it to have her, um, her work in my book. Um, so this is the bit that I was looking for about white fellas. Somewhere here. Oh, yeah. 
this is written to European women, as in meaning settler women you know, on this great continent. We have been called urgently to educate our own people. For over 400 years, the Pacific experience has been allowed to proceed under the cover of our ignorance. We must break the conspiracy of silence that keeps the Pacific on the edges of our maps and the corners of our minds. European women must learn the true story of the Pacific. Too many lies have been told for too long. Indigenous peoples have been silenced and their experiences erased. Europeans dominate the process of knowledge through the imposition of our own cultural resilience, reliance on the written word. And as a result, the knowledge contained within oral traditions is silenced. The stories of indigenous women must be heard. The silence must be broken. And we European women have a role in this. It is after all, our people who have forgotten how to listen. This is the purpose of this book. It is a book of and for storytellers. We need to learn, we need to listen, learn, and retell the stories of our indigenous sisters. We need to learn and tell our own stories. We need to listen to the stories of all our sisters around the world. We need to tell ourselves stories of our shared vision and of our strengths. It is through our stories, our songs and our murmurings late at night that we will formulate the world, the words that will pass our experience onto each other and the generations to come. We need to tell our stories until all women of all cultures are free of oppression. It's time now for the white fellas on this continent to start talking truth. And um, it's really good to see that happening. So at this stage, I was going to introduce you to Porphyry, but she's not here. But many of you are, and for this we. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zoll. Um, yes, I'm very sorry that Porfiri is not here. Um, Porfiri's full name is very long, and it is Porfiri <laughs> Karamarama Kamira Rika Hike. Um, and she. Hike. Has... Hike. Okay. Um, she has been a, a major force in New Zealand, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, she was, in fact, the private secretary to the Ministry of Women's Affairs back in 1988 and also a po policy analyst in the Department of, of Maori Affairs and has taught English at the University of Canterbury and works now at Alfriston College. Um, she also chaired the Te Ha Toi Māori um, Aotearoa's Committee on Māori Writers. So um, she's also contributed to another spin-off number of spin effects books. So I am still looking out to see if she arrives, and if she does, um, I will ask her to speak. We have also um, Manya Andrews has also not appeared. I have tried ringing both of them and I'm not getting through. So um, I don't know what's happening. And so I'll just say a few words about Manya. And if she comes on, then I'll reintroduce her. So Auntie Manya Andrews is an Aboriginal barrister and author from the Kimberley region of Western Australia. Her first book, Seven Sisters of the Pleiade Stories from Around the World, was published in 2004 and was a finalist in the 2005 Lammy Awards in the US. She explored the world mythology surrounding the Pleiades star cluster, beginning with the dreaming of the seven sisters. And she wrote a second book a few years ago called Journey into Dreamtime, and she has another book coming up soon, both with um, Ultimate World Publication. So now then we move on 
uh, to Auntie Ellen Trevorrow. So we've, we've come to you a little faster than expected. <laughs> um, Auntie Ellen Trevorrow is a cultural weaver. She's contributed in important ways to Kungun Ngarangeri Mimina Yunan, which is also called Listen to Ngarangeri Women Speak, and to Ngarangeri Wurrawarra. She lives on Ngarangeri land in the Kurong, South Australia, and uses traditional methods for weaving of rushes. Her weavings can be found in the South Australian Museum, and there are photos of it in Kungung Nanangeri Mimina Yunan. Should I introduce you at the same time, Di? Will you be speaking together or separately? We're going to be in a conversation. Okay. Yeah. So in that case, I'll introduce Di. Uh, Diane Bell is Professor Emerita of Anthropology, George Washington University, and Distinguished Honorary Professor at ANU and has worked over many decades recording the lives of women in many parts of Australia. Her 1983 book, Daughters of the Dreaming, with its fo focus on Kaidich women of Central Australia, was a groundbreaking book. Nan and Jerry Woodawarren, a world that is, was, and will be, brought to the fore the women's stories around the debacle that was the Hindmarsh Island Bridge. Uh, Naranjeri Wurrawan won the New South Wales Premier's Glee Book Award for cultural and literary criticism and was shortlisted for several others. Diane continues her work acting for Indigenous communities. So over to both of you. Uh, Ellen, do you want to welcome us to um, yeah. the country, please? Yeah. Um, Nangunu Wallen Wan Naldi Andu Rui. Nangui Michi Napi Nanjuri Mimina. Good afternoon. Welcome to Nanjuri Country. My name is Ellen Travara. I'm a Nanjuri woman. And I'm here with Diane. And I've got Jolena Haynes alongside me doing the Zoom for me, technology. And I'm in Annie Alice's house. Who we went along over to our launch of our book. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Di? Uh, Nanui meets Diane. My name is Diane. Um, uh, kun Tang Ang Nan Kalyam. Um, it's so good for us all to be together here. Um, I'm not sure I want to bring greetings from Canberra, but I do want to pay my respects <laughs> <laughs> to the Nanawal on whose country. I am currently living. Um, I'm hoping what we're seeing is the last throes of the patriarchy. Um, but, you know, <laughs> yes, we all just have to do a big, <laughs> big clap. <Yeah. laughs> okay. Um, we thought because Ellen and I have known each other since um, 1996, when we were both much younger, um, we thought we might just uh, tell you about how we got to meet each other. Ellen, do you want to start? What brought us together? Yeah. Um, what brought us together? Well, we're going to go back to um, the High Marsh Island problems we had over our, our side. And of course, Di was with us, with the elders and uh, the sharing of the stories. And, uh, and it all went to a royal commission into our culture. And uh, it brought a lot of families together. Um, we've got to uh, thank, we've got to thank uh, you, Di, for uh, putting your hand up to do what you've done with, the, with our book, uh, the Nudgery book, uh, Warra Warren. We've got to thank you for that because you collated all the stories from the elders at the time of all this going on around us. And, and uh, and they're beautiful stories that we put together uh, with our elders. Um, and do you want to go from there, Di? Yeah, um, I think the title of the book, I want to pay respect, of course, to um, Uncle Tom, your um, husband now passed away. But Tom was the one when we were talking about the this proposal to build a bridge, which was going to desecrate a woman's site on an island called Kumarank, and Kumari means pregnancy and ank means at so it's the place of pregnancy and the building of a bridge was the same as the putting a stake through the uh the uterus it was devastating for women and women didn't want to tell the story 
The Royal Commission found them to be liars in 1995. In 1996, I was in the, um, the USA and Doreen Catignery, the sister of uh, Doris Catignery, whose book was held up by, by Sue Hawthorne. Um, Doreen rang me in the US and I was in the middle of a blizzard in January or late December. And she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm digging my car out of a blizzard, Dodo. And uh, she said, well, you better hop on a plane and come over here and help us because it's a nice hot day in Adelaide. So <laughs> I came across and that was the beginning of meeting um, Ellen and her husband, Tom, and her children, not all of her children that she now has were with us at that stage. I've watched the children grow up and get married and grandchildren and great-grandchildren or the grannies. Um, but Tom was the one when we started to collect the stories to try and figure out um, how we could tell the story without having to tell the secret. And Tom said, um, it's Warren Warren. He said, it's knowing and believing. That's the thing, right? And as we collected the stories and I went through um, with Narendra, with the stories that they'd told in the one of the hearings, one of the court hearings, and negotiated with every single person what was in that story and what was okay to be published and what couldn't be published. And of course, more stories came out. Do you remember this, Ellen? Every time we sat down, yes. somebody had come up and say, oh, oh, hang on, hang on, there's another bit. You haven't heard this bit, you haven't heard this bit, right? And spin effects at this stage, we had a, a little book of a couple of hundred pages, right? Yeah. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. I, I can't even remember how many pages it finished up as. 800 or something, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> it was the wealth of Nan and Jerry storytelling. And the good part about the Hyde Marsh Island um, story is that although the women were called liars, were found to be liars in 1995, um, although the next commission, the next inquiry um, fell foul and uh, was never... Um, made public, the Matthews Inquiry. Uh, they changed the law in Australia so that you could protect sacred sites anywhere in the country except on Hindmarsh Island, which on the face of it looks racist. Um, the High Court found that you can have a little amendment of a law, um, so we're stuck with that. The good part of it was that we got back into court under another case. The women were vindicated in 2001. They were found to be... Um, we're witnesses of truth. The uh, court heard from everybody, all the stories that we collected, they could all be told properly and respectfully in court. The South Australian government apologized and the site that the, the Royal Commission in 1995 had found didn't exist is now registered and on the register of sacred sites in South Australia. So these are all you know, happy stories, but the tragedy of it is that the bridge was built Mm. Um, the land was desecrated and the stake that went into the ground with that bridge was a stake through a lot of families. And we're still dealing with that, aren't we, Ellen? Yes, still going through with it. Yeah. Um, do you want to say something about just how hard that's been with the, the young'uns and the grannies? Uh, um, it, ha it had a big impact on our, our young ones. Um, mm. um, you know, to be called liars and fabricators, the elders, Mm. It uh, it affected our young ones, and um, you know we'd go across the Kumarang Amish Island, and when we come back, you know the effect that they when they went to school, and uh, it was it was hard for them to die. Mm. You know? um, it was really sad to have a royal commission into our culture, mm. and that affect them badly. Mm. And us too. Hmm. And those those traumas, like the Judy was talking about, they continue. Yeah. Those divisions within the community are still there and you can still stir them up. And they're being stirred up at the moment by some people who should know better. Yeah. Um, shall we fast forward to when you and Tom came to America, came to the USA? I go to there now. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Um, um, you know, the, um, the funny thing is, Di, I found the tape the other day. Oh, did you? The video? Yes. When, yes. You, went, when you came to Harvard and spoke at Harvard? Yes, I found it. Yeah. And so we've got to sort that out. Fantastic. Uh, because it's only a little little square tape. Yeah. One of those. 
one yeah, of those. Right. Yeah. So, um, and uh, and that was just pure luck that I got to go over there, Di, because the, uh, the other one that was going pulled out. And, and so I had to fill the shoes alongside of Tom. And thank you for looking after us over there. Um, well, <laughs> Ellen walked <laughs> on water while she was there. So I was living on a little lake and it froze. <laughs> Tom wasn't game enough, was he? No, he said he had one pair of shoes. He was, you girls, he said, you're stupid. You can do that. <laughs> I'm not walking uh, on water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, yeah, um, yeah, that 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 changed in such a short time while we were over at uh, Harvard Uni. Froze just like that. Like that, yeah. And, you know, we we put a good uh, presentation together with many thanks to you, Di. Oh, thanks to you. Yeah, and you Kevin brought Tom. some, do you remember you brought some rushes over? Some rushes yeah. from Maringal, from your great-great-grandmother's country? Yes, that's right. No, and, we started, and we started weaving them? Yeah, we, we, while we were doing the presentation, we did some weaving. Yeah. And um, we left some uh, uh, baskets over there in Harvard. So there, I'll look at Di's there piece, see? Mm. Her weaving piece. So... Yeah. Ellen brought rushes, probably illegally, into the US so we could weave in the US. I <laughs> held on to them. And then, so that was in 1997. Yeah. When I came back to Australia in 2005, I brought them back with me, again, illegally. Um, we soaked them in my bathtub and they're as good as gold. And now they've been woven back into this. And um, Ellen has done some very big weaving. She made a whole whale, a life-size whale. And into its tail, Jelena, who is doing the um, the tech Zoom down there with Ellen at the moment, um, she wove the tail, and some of that was those uh, rushes from Marangal. Is that right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, yep. The, those rushes went into the 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 big tail that that's gone to France. Yeah. So yeah. it's now in France. So they've been yeah. around the world several times. France. Yes. So right. Been over and back here and there again within the tail. And the thing about weaving, what do you always say about weaving? Stitch by stitch? Stitch, circle by circle. Weaving is like the creation of life. All things are connected. That's right, starting from the middle here. Yeah. And pulling all those, pulling the weaving around and you're making family as you do it, right? Hey, and Di, so, yeah. Di, yeah. Ves Vespa put up her basket there too. I saw that. I saw that. Oh, yes. this is the basket. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh. Yep. You know, Sue, yes. when you were saying that Ellen's um, weavings are in the museum in South Australia, they're also all around the world. Yeah. Those, um, can you show us again, Vespa, the basket, Seven Sisters, the sister bar? Can you open it out so we can see how it joins? Best, can, can you say yes. something so that we, it goes to your screen, Vespa? Vespa? Just, just say something so that... Uh, I can see it. I, I can't at the moment. Oh, Vespa, unmute yourself. Women. Vespa, unmute yourself. Ah, there. Yeah. Beautiful. Respect yeah. for non women here. Can yeah. you see it now? Yes. Okay, so it's woven in one piece. Wow. Mm -hmm. Right around. And it's two perfect halves. Yeah. Right. And Ellen made seven of them for the seven sisters. And where did they go, Ellen, the seven ones? They go to Japan? No, the seven sisters went to Goldburn. Yeah, that's and, not, and that's they not far enough. <laughs> it it travelled around, and then they uh, for two years, and it came back to Camp Carong. Right. right. Yeah. Right. But the whale is in France. Yes. Right. Okay. And, cool. and the other, uh, the other one is in um, uh, the South Australian Museum. Mm -hmm. And the pondy, and the nori, the pelican, is yep. over there in Canberra in the National okay. Gallery. So Pondy is the um, is the Murray cod, and Nori is the pelican, and they're again life size ones that Ellen's made. Right, it's quite genius making them. Absolute genius. Yeah, yeah. She's the maker of big things. Right. Um, the point the point we were making about the rushes having come from it's the point where the Murray comes into Lake Alexandrina, a place called Marangong. Um, those rushes survived all that travel. And all they had to be, all that had to happen was that they had to be come from fresh water and then be soaked and damped down and you can use them again. So as long as you've got fresh water, 
And this is the story of the, you know, the, the problem with the Murray Darling that the Nalan jury had the story for. Um, if the water's fresh, the rushes are alive and you can keep on that making family. And when that gets salted and brackish, that's when you know the country's dying. So, you know, that's your story for don't take so much water out of the river. Don't be greedy. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about the week, the, um, the um, Kunan Nanajuri Mimina book, Ellen? Yeah. Oh, you want to hear this one? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, we had some surplus funds. And Tom said, oh, you'd be able to do that book you wanted to do. Oh, I said. So I got on the phone to Diane. <laughs> and I asked Diane what she's up to. What you doing? This weekend, we need to do a book. We need to put that together, and uh, yeah, yeah, just keep talking, Ellen. Keep talking. Yeah, uh, well, I I, I asked um, asked I would she be able to come over for the weekend? We need to do a book, and um, oh, she said yes. I will do that for you, but there it is. There it is. And um, and we pulled everyone together and we made it happen. And we, what we did, four meetings, though? Yeah, four, four, workshops. four workshops. Yep. Four, four workshops with this book. And uh, we brought young ones together. And also through technology with the young ones with dive was really good. But it was a, a good get together. And the, what we put in the book was very good. Di, can I open up a page? Yeah. Have you got it there? Yeah, I've got it here. I don't have any copies left. Maybe Spinifex will send me some. <laughs> yeah, we need we need more. Can you see that? <laughs> yep, I can see it. Yeah. Hold it up right in front of your face, Ellen. Yep. There we go. There. Yep. Uh, and seeing that photo is the generation of us as weavers in my family. And that's how all our families are. Yep. As um, and now the baby's there now. She's twenty four and she's got a baby of her own now, two years <laughs> old. So we'll have to teach her how to weave. Yep. Yep. Aaliyah. And her name is Aaliyah. That's Ellie's um, little girl. Ellie's little one. Yeah. Yeah. Ellie. Ellie was. Ellie's quite pale. So Ellie always says she was the little white girl at all the. Um, <laughs> she was the little <laughs> white Nadinjuri girl at all the protests. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. She grew um, up on the protest field. <laughs> yes, that's right. And 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 that's a um my well on my side, uh, the cycle of us as weavers. Mm -hmm. And it starts from my great great grandmother to my great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother, um, myself, the daughter. Tom and I had one boy, and Ellie's a, a really good weaver too. Mm -hmm. And we'll we'll have to pass it on to her mum, but that's oh. the generation of weavers. And one of the things that I've been doing in archives is I've gone back to that very very the first lady Louisa Auntie Louisa yeah. Queen Louisa, yeah. and I'm st starting to reclaim her life from the archives. And she had two children with the a white protector doing a great job of protecting her, mm -hmm. um, had two children, um, and that's um, Ellen's uh, relatives come from that side of the family, and yeah. the white side of the family is still um, quite strong in South Australia. So it's a really interesting project trying to figure out this relationship between Louisa Carpenter and George Mason from the uh, 1840s um, through to possibly the 1860s, yeah. where there was a real possibility of there being um, respectful relationships between uh, white people, because he learnt the language and uh, actually tried to get land for women and a number of very interesting things. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a really interesting um, going back and rereading, not having heard the stories in the family, going back and seeing what's actually in the archives and what can be reclaimed. And yeah. now that so much is digitised on Trove, we can get into a lot of stuff that we couldn't get into. Uh, before. Ellen, before we finish, do you want to talk about our play? The play oh, we did? Oh, to play. Yeah, the play. Well, our play. <laughs> uh, we we uh, died put a play together with us. Your stories. 
yes, yeah. with our stories. And uh, well, it, I, I started off as wow. being that. I started off from being the auntie, but then I become the grandmother and Debbie become the auntie. But we traveled from Meningi to Melbourne and I didn't do my part. And you didn't I'm, learn your lines. I didn't learn my lines properly. That's right. Yeah. Because I, I was the auntie, and then I become the grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was a verbatim play for those of yeah. you who were interested. And so I become the driver, <laughs> and uh, drove us over to Melbourne, and we were doing our our part as we're going along, and she's listening to us. Very patient I is with us. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when we got over there and we settled in and and uh, going through the play and um, and my first page, um, Di said, before you go to bed, I want to hear you say that your full page of what. <laughs> Checking me out. You know, she had the whip out for me. But. No, I I got through it. I got through it before the night's out and we were ready for the next day. But it was all pulled together really good, Di. Thank you for that. Thank you. And, uh, and our young ones, that uh, play was, it was really good. So what we did, we made a stage in this little part of the museum at Tarawara in Hillsville. Mm. And we built a kind of a museum out of boxes and we built a place where the weavers were. So it was the kind of the conversation between what gets archived by museums and what they think they're dealing with and what the women themselves were doing, right? So yeah. as they so they're sitting on stage, all of them weaving, right? Yeah. Th throughout the play, right. with the children all around them, you know, asking questions of the grandmas, etc. And the other people we were working with had done a very beautiful back um, projection with country and the stories and the people. And yeah. um, and it was fantastic. You know, they were yeah. just, just great. It was spellbinding. And at the end of it, the audience was just full of questions. And um, all the weavers were uh, were busy answering the questions. But one person said, um, what's going to happen to all the weaving? <laughs> and you said, yeah. we're going to finish it before we get home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you did. <laughs> yeah. No, it was, that was good, though. It was that really was fun. Uh, yeah, it was really good. And, you know, we did um, two sessions. We did. We did it twice. Yeah, and uh, the questions, you know, they weren't the same, but they were really good. No, the questions uh, were great. Yeah, uh, and a good crowd we had while we were there. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the things they pointed out in the play was that um, when it said, oh, you know, there's no stories of women, you know, women aren't doing anything, there's nothing in the archives, there's nothing in the record. And one of the stories in the play is when we wanted to do women's business, we told the missionaries we were going to collect rushes. And they thought, yes, right, you know, that's good. Women are going to do some work. The devil finds work for idle hands. Mm -hmm. So off they'd go and do their business, right? So yes. really lovely subversive action that they were having good, good old laugh about. Yes, yeah, it's really you good. Know, Alan, we've, we've talked about all the stories that we've shared, you know, over the yes. over the years. And sometimes mm -hmm. you and I sit up late at night and talk. Yes, yeah. Uh, sometimes we don't get much sleep at all. Um, what and, about but, the, what yeah. about the last what about the oh. last time what about <laughs> the last time I went across to Canberra and you're going to put me in a motel? Well, I thought you'd be comfortable. Ah, uh, if uh. I go to if I go to Canberra, <laughs> I don't mind the couch. I said to Di, you've got a couch there. I'll take that. <laughs> and so, we, got... <laughs> so we and... filled my bathtub with the rushes. <laughs> yeah. Again, again. Yeah, yeah. But that was our big, um, our big experiment at, at the Australian National University was mm. teaching engineering students how to weave as a way of teaching them different ways of thinking about systems yeah. um, and technology. And they all say that that's the best class that ever had was what they learned from, from Ellen. And last year we did it on Zoom, which was really quite remarkable. Mm. We all learned a lot about that. And thank you, Jelena. Yes. <laughs> <Right>. Yes. <laughs> this <But> technology. In... <laughs> you you uh, conquered it. You were queen of the of the Zoom. <laughs> if you uh, put a camera over somebody's shoulder when they're weaving, 
you can teach weaving much better than you can sitting across from them. It's like trying to teach somebody knitting, you're going the other way. You know, so Ellen had a camera over her shoulder where the students could see exactly what she was doing. And then she had a screen up in front of her where she could see the students. It was just yeah. a fantastic use of technology. But Ellen, I want to just come back to the whole business about storytelling and yeah. the, the way in which we've always negotiated them. You know, like I've always read to you, you know, you tell me a story, I write it down, I, we read it back, we talk about it, you know, before anything happens to it, um, which is the proper process. But one of the things I wanted to say, because it's SpinFX's 30th birthday, is SpinFX allowed, actually pioneered for me, the idea of moral rights in a story. Yeah. And when we had all those Nurnanjuri stories for Nurnanjuri Wurrawarrin, in 97, 98. And I was really concerned because there were so many people's stories in that book and they were set in a different typeface. So you knew when the nun and jury voice was, was there. But I didn't, want, I didn't want those voices to be um, copyright to me because they're not my stories. And Susan said, there's a way of doing this. We can do it as moral rights. Susan, say something about moral rights because Spinifex is just fantastic because of that. Yes, um, moral right applies to tellers of stories, writers of stories um, who must be credited um, with the story and the story cannot be used in a way that distorts the original intention of the teller or the writer. So it's actually a very interesting um, uh, version of a, of a right around um, intellectual property and I think it's very good and we do have that in yep. all of our books now. Yeah it's in all of the books now but that made for working with Nunanjuri um, because they were so sen people were so sensitive re reasonably so to having their stories exposed that was what made it possible to publish a book that had so much personal uh, reflection and storytelling in it. it wouldn't have happened otherwise so thank you to spin effects for that and thank you to spin effects for just being a fantastic feminist publisher because not and very were warren would never have been published no no only crazy would people. never have been <laughs> only crazy people. we got a legal opinion you know, and they said, oh, well, Diane, you're living in the US. They're not going to sue you. <laughs> Actually, the reason oh, I well. thought they wouldn't sue us was because they didn't want to come up against you, Di. They oh, well, that's oh. reassuring. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but they didn't. They didn't. They threatened to sue me a couple of times on things. But, yeah, <laughs> but they never did. Everybody else got sued who wrote anything um, at that stage. Anybody who was living in South Australia at that time, they remember how nasty all of that was. Yes, Vespa's nodding her head. Yes. People who wrote letters to the editor got sued. Everybody got sued. There was no freedom of speech. I think they also thought reply. they couldn't get anything out of spinning. So, in... <laughs> well, that kind of might have been true too. You would have been a tough old thing to go up against. <laughs> uh... So on your 30th, we should be reflecting upon all the brave things that you've done. Thank all you. The, all the books you've kept in print, right? Yes. Kept books in print. You've got a backlist. <laughs> That's me. Right? Who's got backlists nowadays? No, backlists right? are anything more than six months old. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, you've got yeah. one with me that goes back over 35 years. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So congratulations to uh, Spinifex and happy birthday to Spinifex. And, yeah. you know, you've just been fantastic. Ellen, you should have the last word. Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you so much. And uh, it's been really good to be here, part of, of this invitation. And congratulations to Spinifex Press. That's a lot of years, a lot of stories, a lot of books. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Should we sing happy birthday? Yeah. All right, unmute everybody. <laughs> unmute, unmute everyone. <laughs> uh, so can I, um, I'm just trying to figure out where I can unmute, but you can who all can unmute. Hold a, who can hold a tune? Okay. Oh. <laughs> Ready? Right, you're one, amazing. two, 
three. Happy birthday to you. Hey, hey. <laughs> <You're> amazing. <laughs> Renata, it's over to you, I think. Yes. Uh, well, I, can, can I? Fantastic. That's totally fantastic. I think, you know, that's the best thing. That's worth doing 30 years of hard work to get to this fantastic. Happy birthday singing. Thank you so very much. Across well, any time zones. <laughs> I've got the honor of closing this, this wonderful session. So, first of all, I want to thank all the authors. Now, could you just mute yourself again? So, I <laughs> Student Bellamy. Thank you for your fantastic books. And also, just don't behave, these women. It's the same every time. They don't behave. Anyway, thank you very much for your fantastic books and all the other important community work that you're doing. And those of you who have been on the Zoom, please look at the books on the Spinifex Press website. And also, if you don't get our newsletter yet, please subscribe. It's free. And then you see all the wonderful things that we are doing. And if you're teaching courses, put these books on your courses. Now, it's very humbling for Susan and me to be here and think back 30 years ago to the 15th March when we announced Spinifex. This was the day when Susan and I flew to Sydney to attend the seminar on, quote, finance, finances for non-finance staff. <laughs> <laughs> and came back with big worries because we were truly hanging from the learning curve. It was so steep, we had no idea. But, you know, here we still are 30 years later. And whatever we did over the last 30 years, we never did it alone. Of course, firstly, we had all our wonderful authors and every book is another pleasure to work with such fantastic women uh, and to really, you know, go over their words and how they want them on the page and how they want the blurb and do they like whatever we do? Do they like how, what the book looks like, it's a, a, a great enterprise. And it is still exciting even after 30 years. So I want to thank our current staff without whom we would not exist. Thank you to Marilyn Damiano, office manager for more than 20 years. And I think you are on this Zoom somewhere. And Sharon Murphy, who is now your offsider. And thank you to Pauline Hopkins, our eagle eye. Eagle-eyed senior editor and events manager. Thank you to Rachel McDermott, as well as your office assistant, Dashi, <laughs> uh, for your inspiring promotional work for Spinifex. And last but not least, Caitlin Roper, who sells on social media. And also to freelancers, Deb Snipson for her gorgeous covers, and to Helen Christie for internal design. Okay. And most importantly, most importantly, I really want to thank Susan Hawthorne for her 30 years of heart and soul that she continues to pour into Spinifex to make it, it what it is, a wonderful radical feminist and lesbian publishing company. I thank you so very much, Susan. And it's an honor and a pleasure to live with you and our dogs, who Nala doesn't want to be a star, obviously, it's gone away. Um, and whilst I have the floor, let me please remind you that next Tuesday we have the next event in the Spinifex birthday um, Zooms. We have a Zoom event with on this very, very beautiful book. Can I show the whole cover? It's our next poetry book and um, by Usha Ak. <laughs> Terrible. Akela. And it's called, I Will Not Bear You Sons. And our very <laughs> long time friend and colleague, Robin Rowland, will launch it, which is another pleasure. Mm -hmm. And it is during the Australian daytime. It's 11 a.m. to 12 a.m. 
Sydney time. That is so that uh, that Usha, who lives in Texas, uh, can actually be awake for the launch of her book. So uh, please, if you have time, come to that and listen to it. It's a very strong and passionate book of really fantastic poetry. And then, yeah. as I said, if you if you um, if you are on our mailing list, our newsletter, then you will hear about all the other events and, of course, the new books that we're having out. And may I just preview for July this year, we're having a very, very big, 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 big book, and it's called Not Dead Yet. And it has a subtitle, which is probably something like um, passion. No, it's I think it starts with feminism, passion and women's liberation. And it has 54 contributions by women who are all over 70. So Susan, unfortunately, didn't quite make it. But Diane is in it, which is very, very fantastic. And we still love to get something from Auntie Judy. Mm, Auntie Judy, are you right? Hey, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that will be, it's, it's a fantastic book. Um, we were, and Betty, of course, Betty McCurry, I think is also listening. She is in it. And many, many other women uh, that uh, it, it's a fantastic book. And what we... Uh, I mean, of course, we thought it would be wonderful to read and all of that, but we are so excited because it turns out it's a real history on the women's liberation movement. And Spider Red Gold just reminds me that she's in, in it as well. Sorry, Spider. Yes. And so it's oh, a history yeah. of what some women in the early days of the women's liberation movement. Um, fantastic. So that will be our big July event, and we'll have another room with the <laughs> room Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get away. <laughs> Another Zoom, lots of different women. <laughs> so over to you, Susan, so you can say some um, fitting uh, words that we can finish this. Um, well, as you can see on the screen, uh, you can go to our website, and we, um, Rachel, um, did the did these beautiful screens for tonight's event but she also created our new um, website and you can see the top of that there um, it's truly wonderful and the website is now functioning really fantastically much better than our previous one and we we were a bit reluctant because we got very attached to our old one but we're very glad we did it um, and Rachel, I have to thank you for the absolutely beautiful screenshots for tonight, the PowerPoint. It's just fantastic. Um, and yes, I mean, it's been fabulous to be part of this. I'm sorry that several of our speakers didn't make it, but nevertheless, we've had a truly fabulous evening. So I'm just going to go backwards through the screenshots again so you can look at the books Diane's Daughters of the Dreaming, first published in 1983, Ngaran Jerry Wurrawar and Kungan Ngaran Mimana Yunan, um, The Seven Sisters of the Pleiades, fabulous book also, Daughters of the Pacific, Holding Yawayu, Trauma. Some amazing books, all of them. Mm -hmm. Recreating Song Lines, truly beautiful. Karu, kick the tin, and there we are. So um, I think we've probably reached the end of the program and it's practically right on time. How extraordinary. How good is that? Yes. If, if anyone Amazing. is really bursting to ask a question, we have a little bit of time to do that, but not much. So, and... <laughs> Did Gloria Orenstein ever actually speak or make contact? Yeah, Gloria is here. Gloria? Gloria. Gloria is here, definitely, yes. I saw Gloria. Sure. Gloria. Gloria, where are you? Gloria. 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 I'm here. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> oh, Gloria, hello, it's Suzanne. Not animated, I don't know why. The, the picture is very old and it's not animated and the whole, I did... I got in very late because I couldn't get it all together, but here I am. And it, right. I just enjoyed some, I tell everybody about your press, 
I love it. I think what you did is so remarkable, such a gift to the world, and I'm very excited to follow along with all the events that are coming up. So good to see you. Good to see you. I'm sorry that's not animated. It's not. I don't. I, I don't know how it works. <laughs> well, it must be very late your time. So thank you for for stay, staying up so late. Oh yeah. I, I went to another Zoom earlier that was also really amazing that people popped out of my life from all over and then I took a little nap and then I got up for you. <laughs> that is my life. That's my life. That's commitment for you. Does anybody else want to say something? Please just do so. Make sure you're unmuted before you speak. No? It's been wonderful. Thank you. Really wonderful. Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah. Very big thank you to everybody. It's been fantastic. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, it's Judy. Thank you so much. I had no, no idea what to expect. And I was really, I, I kept it really short and sharp because I thought there was going to be more time. There were going to be other speakers. So, yeah, it's been really exciting. And, you know, two of the people I absolutely love, Diane Bell and everything that she's done and, and mm. Zol, they both inspire me, but all of you inspire me. And I have your books, all of them. So, yeah, so I want to thank you. Thank and you, thank Judy. You thank I you. just like to say to the, all of you, particularly the bosses from this country, but I would just like to say to all of you, thank you so much. Um, Renata and Susan, you just rock. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> we can rock. We can rock and roll if we have to. <laughs> not dead yet. Don't forget. Not dead yet. Yeah. Not dead yet. <laughs> we need t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> well. <laughs> I think I think we might. Hello, have... Eileen. So... Hi, Eileen. How yeah. are you? Good to see you. You're in Brisbane, I think, aren't you, Eileen? Doing amazing things. Anyway. Are you talking to Zoe? To Eileen. I'm oh. saying hello to Eileen. But yeah. Eileen, aren't you I back home now? Yeah. Oh, she might be now. Anyway, lovely seeing you all. And Renata and Sue, thank you for inviting me. It's been many years and I, I, I've loved tonight. Thank you. It was lovely. Thanks, Pam. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. Okay, well, I suppose we should end the party. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go. Time for a cup of tea. <laughs> yes. Something stronger, oh, I think. I think something stronger, yeah. Yes. And we uh, didn't even think about dinner today, so God knows what we're going to eat. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Speakers, Auntie Judy and Auntie Ellen. Thank you very, very much. And Dai, of course, and all. Thank you. I, I would just like to say I'm so sorry that the bosses from Balgo weren't here. Um, they... I know you try. It was, it's, it, sometimes it just doesn't work. I know you try. They, they, they were in a car heading to Fremantle <laughs> for a exhibition. Yeah. Well, so we saw that's why it didn't happen. The painting was lovely with the Nupper That yes, was lovely. Yes, it was. It was it's very great. Nice. So that was good yeah. that you, you provided that soul. Yeah. Even Nup, that good. Two Nupper two Nunkers and one Nakamara, my oh. sister. Nakamara sister for me. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Before we go, yes, I just want to say something about what's happening right at this moment. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people contacting me about working in the area of sexual violence. And I just think, and I'm talking about Cape York, I'm talking about the central uh, part of the Northern Territory and Western New South Wales, and I've been in the Kimberley, um, and they're just wanting to do more work in that. I'm talking about our women, right? Um, and, and so I think this is really important to me at the moment, watching what's happening in Canberra and seeing the deceit and dishonesty there. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and the real work will be done on the ground. It will be done in healing uh, with our women and for our women and for our kids, our little kids. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the joyous thing that I can tell you is that a young girl that I was working with uh, just two days ago gave birth to her first baby and it's a really good relationship she's in now and she's really healed after what happened to her. So that, that to me is really, really important. And that is the power of what you have done, Susan, um, with Spinifex Press. People are listening. That's, that's the message I have for you. Yeah. I sure hope so. <laughs> but yes, yeah. thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that.